I introduce our panelists to you all. I have Ms. Shabnam Fakir Mohammed on my right hand. She is the independent global director for Dubai Islamic Bank Pakistan, and she is the nominee director for the IF uh, for the IMF uh, for the World Bank. I have Mr. Abdul Kareem. Um, he is the CEO of World, Wall Street Exchange. And then I have Mr. Umar. He is the head of operations Cash Express. So welcome you all in the panel. To start with, I would like to hear from Ms. Shabnam, what are the key advantages of cross-border remittances for both senders and receivers? Can you please provide some examples of how cross-border remittances are positively impacted individuals and communities. And add to this, what are the main challenges and barriers that people face when sending or receiving cross-border remittances? Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we've had a lot of conversation this morning about remittances and the impact on society as a whole. And right now, we'll talk a little bit about the impact on individuals. This includes both the senders and the receivers. Now, there are about 100 million migrant, 200 million migrant workers basically around the world that are sending money to around 800 million recipients. This is globally. This is a huge market that's rife for disruption but we'll come on to that when we talk more about the technology side of things. But in terms of benefits for individuals, what you really have is people have left their countries, gone abroad to try to earn a living for their families, and they would like to have an avenue through which to send a lifeline essentially to their families to be able to cover, in most cases, we're talking about food on the table, we're talking about basic education, we're talking about health care and security, of some kind. Uh, a lot of these remittances are going to middle and low income countries and so what you're really providing is an entire uh, income for those households, like 75% of the income of those households is coming from these remittances. Um, what remittances, remittances are providing to the actual senders is the actual efficiency, the ability to have access to send cash through, let's call them legal channels. Uh, or regulated channels, and also uh, the speed with which to do it, to be able to do it quickly, to be, do it, be able to do it in a cost-efficient manner, and um, to be able to do it in a manner where they can at least somehow track, and there's some kind of a paper trail. I mean, we've talked about tracking as well, so we'll come, into that, come back to that also. The simple idea is, this is something that has a massive socioeconomic impact on the receiving countries, and it's essential for those individuals who have literally left their countries, left their families, left the comfort of their homes to go and earn money, to give them a, a bandwidth, to give them the channels or corridors as they're officially known, to be able to then send that money back home. Um, we see clear advantages to this. There's a simple fact that obviously the societies will overall benefit because once that money reaches, okay, let's just talk in Pakistan context, given that we're here and we are talking about Pakistan, but you know, anyone who's receiving that money in Pakistan is then spending it in the economy. So it, even though it's not having a direct investment impact, although in some cases it does, because around 25% of those remittances are used for some kind of investment or some kind of employment or self-employment. So it does have an impact on society as a whole because you're spending on the education, you're spending on people's um, making the future and the human resource and the manpower of the country better. And so there's a whole host of impacts, essentially. So there's benefits, obviously, to the senders and the receivers and overall to the society itself. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Ms. Shabnam. I request Mr. Abdul Kareem to add on to what Ms. Shabnam has uh, uh, mentioned about the advantages and uh, for the benefits for the receivers and the senders of remittances. And I agree completely with what she said, uh, totally. Uh, but uh, we can add also to that, Yani, uh, when you look at it uh, from a social development case uh, for these, uh, these individuals who are there, you can see that 
uh, as rightly said, they make use of education, uh, they make use of health care, uh, you have job creations because people when they're sending money, they're sending money for either investment, savings, or helping the needed ones there. So even you have creation of jobs there that will help the economy in order to develop more and more. So when you're increasing more jobs, you're doing more businesses, you're creating jobs, the economy is cycling. So that's why we see that certain countries like Pakistan, like Egypt, for example, they depend highly on the uh, remittances revenue that's coming in from uh, uh, the senders' countries. So it helps a lot on the economic cycle. It helps a lot, and they depend on it mainly incoming uh, remittances in order to proceed. And of course, the families of these people, they live on this. So يعني, it's sending money home and making use of this money for other things also. Thank you, Mr. Abdul Kareem. I request Mr. Umar also to touch base on the same. Um, according to your uh, experience, how it is going to be benefit when it comes to the cross-border remittances. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to congra congratulate the organizers for uh, putting up such a wonderful uh, show and um, managing to have such a nice panels, panelists and uh, audience which specialize in, in the field of remittances. Uh, coming to the question, I mean, I can't agree more than the fact that uh, remittances highly impact uh, the social and economic uh, conditions of individuals. Um, and as far as senders and receivers are concerned, they both have a lot of role to play in that. Uh, Senders being are the ones usually who leave their home country and come to other, another country, bearing all the uh, I mean social cost of that and earning and sending money back home, just for the purpose of building the prof life profile of the receivers of their family members back home uh, wherever they are. So um, you can just imagine from the fact, because uh, this is uh, more of a uh, discussion is largely related to Pakistan. So if I give you an example that in Pakistan, the uh, amount of remittances that we received uh, in the last uh, f few fiscal years, it has actu actually um, uh, gone past the uh, USDs we have received through exports. So that's the kind of contribution to the economy and to the people uh, remittances are making uh, and to the people of Pakistan. So definitely that is, uh, um, I mean, a wonderful uh, thing. Uh, and at the same time, uh, as you were talking about the challenges, um, one gentleman pointed out earlier that the word challenge is being used time and again. So I'll replace it with opportunity. So I find an opportunity in, in, in the fact that there is a lot of uh, uh, gray market transactions already happening towards Pakistan, which we, uh, I mean, we um, are uh, uh, respected panelists discussed in detail in the earlier session. So the opportunity there is to convert them to, uh, to legal channel. So that's the biggest opportunity that we have. So it has to be uh, a, I mean, a multi, multi pronged strategy. On one side, we, uh, we try to build the remittances through incentives, like we were discussing that the rebate has been increased to 30 Saudi Rial, which definitely is going to play its role. Then there are certain marketing uh, initiative and incentives taken by the regulator in Pakistan. But at the same time, uh, the other strategy has to be uh, on controlling the Hawala and Hundi uh, business. So that will definitely um, help the country to go to the next level of uh, um, uh, home remittances and further uh, facilitate the lifestyle of the people and support the economy in general. Thank you, Mr. Omar. Uh, what I picked up from the first dis uh, question discussion that the opportunities are always uh, there to overcome the challenges. We um, always study the, the economy of the growing uh, countries that they, they face uh, significant challenges uh, when it comes to growth, but the opportunities always are the uh, tools to overcome challenges. So thank you very much uh, uh, for taking up this question. I will continue with you, Mr. Omar. Uh, we had uh, in the previous session a, a lot about the FinTech. And um, as we know that this is the continuation of the previous uh, panel discussion, because our focus is today, uh, though I'm from compliance era, but uh, 
I got an opportunity to sit with the business to to hear uh, from the from the experts how we can improve uh, the the cross border remittances. So, uh, Mr. Zam Zamir Panchabi um, has mentioned about the digitalization and. Uh, he has expressed the vision of uh, his uh, organization, how they have uh, transformed from the from the formal banking, uh, you know, the the the, the um, on-site branches network to the digitalization, where they have experienced a huge move uh, from from a remittance from a branch to a fintech platform. Uh, do you feel that there are some advantages of using? fintech solutions uh, for cross-border remittances compared to traditional uh, methods. Add to this, what role have fintech companies played in reshaping the cross-border remittances landscape and what specific disruptions have they caused? And uh, please just touch upon on the role do technology and uh, fintech innovations play in the improving the efficiency and accessibility of cross-border remittances. So I, I, I'm sorry the question is lengthy, <laughs> but I, I'm sure that you can cover uh, what I'll, I'm I'll, looking I'll, at. I'll, I'll yes. try to yeah, uh, remain please. concise on every aspect of it. So uh, you see, it's not uh, a matter of uh, I being agreeing to the fact that fintechs are transforming the market or anybody else, but it's uh, the data analytics says it all actually. So we have seen so many uh, fintechs within the space of um, cross-border remittances um, coming up, growing in the last, um, I would say, five to six years. And now they are uh, eye to eye with the global leaders, uh, I mean, who have been controlling the market uh, in a very traditional way for, um, for the last so many uh, years or other decades. So definitely they do have a lot of uh, role to play and they're already playing and they have taken the market share quite, uh, I mean, um, dominantly in a very short span of time. Uh, so, um, as it is said that, um, I mean, it reminds me of a quote actually, um, that um, uh, the illiterate of 21st century would not be the one who, who cannot write and read, but the one who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. So for us, now it's the time, the contemporary players, the ones who have been in this business doing the, um, I mean, um, I'm doing it in a relatively non-digital or non-fintech way, to uh, unlearn what we have been learning so far and relearn the new trends and align ourselves. Because you see, going forward, the survival would, would only be for the ones uh, who, uh, for, the, for the companies who are agile, who, who are flexible, and who can just uh, take uh, the transformation process as early as possible. Because you see, the, these fintechs are really agile, and uh, they have, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, taken up the market and in a very quite uh, substantial manner. Uh, what matters the most as a consumer is the fact that uh, is the convenience actually. So what consumers are actually looking for? So consumers are looking primarily for, um, uh, for speed these days because with API integrations everywhere. So speed is something now which is guaranteed in, in a cross-border home remittance structure, though the SWIFT transaction still takes some time, but uh, speed is definitely what matters to the consumer. Uh, at the same time, efficiency, uh, that the service is fine, they, they can actually track their transactions, they, I mean, there is uh, a proper customer support, and at the end of the day, uh, cost effectiveness. So these are the th three key elements which uh, a consumer is looking forward to. So if uh, these fintechs are already providing these uh, three services and they have very nice, fancy uh, applications and uh, in transaction initiation platforms, so definitely that uh, is something which uh, attracts the consumers and the customers and they are gradually moving towards uh, that side. Uh, so um, at the same time, on the receive market side, 
coming to Pakistan. Uh, there are so many uh, digital players already in the market. And uh, uh, as Zameer was mentioning that uh, State Bank of Pakistan has given uh, licenses to five uh, digital banks in Pakistan and they have plans to give more to them. So definitely that would also improve the, uh, the fintech uh, ecosystem in Pakistan. And going forward, we would see more uh, transactions given going towards uh, those uh, fintech players in Pakistan as well. Thank you, Mr. Omar. Um, um, Bishop, uh, Dubai Islamic Bank Pakistan, Dubai Islamic Bank has a network of branches here also and they have a good presence in Pakistan and uh, DIB Pakistan is, is part of the government initiatives when it comes to the Russian digital account and the digitalization and the funds transferring back to Pakistan. Um, may I have your thoughts on the same word Mr. Omar uh, Farooq has mentioned on this particular question? Yeah, sure. Um, it's clear that the fintechs have caused major disruption in the industry. In fact, I come back to the question that the gentleman asked earlier about how, why have we not tried to harmonize the environment before moving into digitalization and all of that. But if you ever look at the way generally things have evolved in the financial service industry for the last 20 years, even back from the global financial crisis to more recent events, to the blockchain crash to, to today, um, every time the industry, the regulators, or any part of an industry makes an advancement, makes changes, it's usually due to disruptors. It's not because they first harmonize everything and then after that we slowly build the blocks. No, it's usually reactive. It's usually because something new comes into the foray or because something happens that was unexpected. And it's usually that which pushes the incumbents to actually change the way they do things. So now, with the with the fintech companies coming in, with their you know, focus on innovation, efficiency, and accessibility, what they've really done is got the brick and mortar banks and the larger institutions on their toes, got them thinking about the fact that actually we're here, we are providing a service, we are providing the same services quicker, more efficiently, with more accessibility without the brick and mortar and cheaper, which means we're able to do certain things that you can't do, it's helped force and push the brick and mortar organizations to think much harder and much more quickly about digitalization and actually start even partnering in some cases with some of these uh, fintech firms and at the same time um, taking steps to digitize their own platforms and actually make uh, their way into uh, the fintech or the fa yeah fintech into, to add fintech to their own uh, sort of array of products for example and the other thing is simply the fact that um, for the sake of financial inclusion, which is something the government of Pakistan is also pushing, but it's also being pushed generally by the SDG goals of the United Nations and you know, the, the G20, is the simple fact that for this financial inclusion, DIB, for example, as a bank, knows that it needs to go more towards digitization as well, and a lot of initiatives are being taken, not just by DIB, but actually in the entire market of Pakistan by all of the banks. But they've made specific uh, initiatives, you know, like they have, DIB, for example, has partnered with Western Union, and that was already like back in 2015. So, uh, so that people can transfer, remit funds from the UAE straight into their bank accounts, and not just the UAE, I believe it's anywhere where, where we have customers around the world, uh, straight into the DIB bank accounts in, in Pakistan. Uh, same way they had, you know, a special free remittances program for any, you know, DIB customers in the UAE to be able to send free remittances. So there are a lot of initiatives uh, that are taking place, both at the government level, on the policy level, and at the institutional level, uh, which are all trying to essentially work so that they can either catch up with or not completely miss out on the train that the fintech uh, disruptors have brought to the, to, to the station, essentially, when it comes to remittances. So... Um, there's a lot happening. Uh, everyone essentially needs to get on board if they don't want to be left behind. If I can add to that also, and if you look at the, the exchange house industry before uh, COVID and after COVID, there's a huge change. And this is where the fintechs came in. If you look at the exchange house industry, especially before COVID, I think there were one or two exchange houses who were starting to have uh, mobile apps. And it was considered like a luxury, actually. It's not that it's a necessity. But after COVID, the ch things have changed. 
And uh, let's say the fintechs took advantage of that where the exchange houses were a bit slow in adapting to that, in bringing in the technology and putting in the infrastructure. Because especially the first year after COVID, yani, the exchange house uh, industry was a bit yani, down, let's say, until it picked up on its feet. So until now, even if you see, not many exchange houses have uh, apps actually uh, that are they are using. So fintechs took advantage of it. They have the technology. Uh, it's much easier for them to move on, and that's why we see the fintechs now that they're dominant in this race. Thank you very much. Um, if I summarize what I understood from the conversation of uh, three of you, that uh, fintech is the future. And uh, this, is the, this is what the financial institution and the market, even the consumer is looking at. At the same time, um, traditional network of branches will continue um, as a key requirement of the consumer. I will have another uh, question to you, Mr. Uh, Abdel Karim, in, in connection with our ongoing discussion. When we are speaking about fintech, what are steps can be taken to enhance the security and privacy of cross-border remittances transactions in an increasingly digital world. When we are moving to fintech, there is a risk of uh, data breach, there is a risk of uh, you know, a technology breach. So uh, we'd like to have your thoughts on, on this. Actually, in general, this is very crucial for both consumers and even for service providers, for both. Because for consumers also, there could be the increase of fraud, of hacking, and of course for service providers, the same. But going forward, what we look at, yani, we have yani, some cases where now you have implementation of the strong authentication. You have uh, the multi-factor uh, uh, authentication where uh, you have uh, biometrics, you have now you see on the apps uh, uh, one-time passwords, you have tokens coming. So this is uh, uh, one way of uh, adding to that. Uh, another thing is the utilization of end-to-end -end encryption and this is mostly of course uh, we can see that where it can uh, enhance uh, the tra remittances and uh, when you look at blockchain which is uh, used mostly for uh, using this kind of method uh, where it is a very secure transferable uh, uh, approach to doing remittance transactions uh, it's also uh, uh, and, uh, the information is only pro for the sender and user available but at the same time it's uh, traceable which that gives the comfort for maybe perhaps when we're talking about compliance it gives a comfort for compliance also also yani we, we there has to be a look at uh, the KYC and AML procedures where uh, you, we have to look at them especially now with the fintechs where they need uh, to be more uh, taken care of, they need to be taken into consideration, the technology advancements also, it's not uh, the usual know your customer status that we used to do and that's why we're seeing a lot of changes and regulations, we're seeing a lot of updates in the regulations also on this. Uh, also if you look at it from a perspective of uh, technology, uh, we can see that even for uh, risk and fraud uh, systems, yani now there's a lot of AI coming in, machine learning algorithm that can help in, in yani safeguarding consumers and customers from any kind of hacking. Thank you, Mr. Abdul Karim. Uh, Mr. Omar Farooq, uh, uh, you're heading the operations of one of the leading MTO in the UAE, the Cash Express. Um, I would like to request you to please uh, add on to what Mr. Abdul Karim has mentioned and uh, addition to this, we, we spoke uh, a lot uh, during the last 15-20 uh, minutes about the advantages and benefits of the fintechs, um, you know, the, the cross-border remittances. Um, I would like to request you also to please add on what strategies can traditional financial institution employ to remain competitive and relevant in, in the face of fintech disruption in cross-border remittances? Okay, um, so the biggest uh, opportunity or the question that has come up in the last few years ever since uh, fintechs uh, have started largely taking the, their share of pie uh, is to evaluate where, where we have to 
collaborate and where have to we have to go in competition with fintechs so this is a million dollar question which the financial institutions have to evaluate every time they are evaluating a business case with a fintech because in certain cases uh, there is uh, an opportunity that we they can avail by tying up with a fintech it can uh, i mean increasingly um, enhance their distribution channel through digital means but at the same time um, the data privacy could be at stake so and similar uh, situations uh, are there so that is something which needs to be uh, very thoroughly evaluated by the financial uh, institutions moreover uh, one big question remains unanswered to larger extent when we talk about fintechs or global remittances uh, in general uh, there are two two uh, main flows of a remittance transaction one is the transaction itself we have largely addressed that through apis and other connectivity methods and it has become almost real time instant uh, the other part is the flow of the funds right so the funding part is still not that real time the way it is uh, in 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 case of a transaction flow so it is largely dependent on pre funding where the uh, companies mtos exchange companies they have to use their liquidity to pre fund their accounts uh, nostro accounts wherever they have to send remittances and it takes a, i mean a cycle of 1 to 2 days where their liquidity is stuck in the air right so uh, there has to be some uh, i mean um, new product development vis a vis uh, flow of funds solutions like uh, on demand liquidity um, i mean it could be uh, based on digital or fiat currency but that is something which will actually complete the puzzle so once we achieve that the 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 fintechs and the conventional players they will be able to do it in real time maximizing value for themselves and for the customers and for the uh, for the uh, uh, partner across borders thank you mr umar uh, we are speaking about the opportunities you know the uh, of growth in remittances but uh, we can't forget as we heard in the previous panel also mr imad was touching upon on, on the importance of compliance as we know that um, i being also as, as a head of compliance in compliance is playing the vital role um, in the protection of business so i would like to hear from you at, and uh, after you i will uh, request mr abdul kareem also to add on it because you are leading the business operations of mto he is leading the traditional uh, uh, financial institution operations and the head uh, 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 being as a, a chief executive officer of world street exchange so i would like to have thoughts from both of you when it comes to you know the regulatory challenges and uh, and the compliance issues which impact the cross border remittances um and how we can um effectively address these challenges and how we can improve um you know um, our business uh, versus compliance and how we can balance between both so i would like to have th uh, uh, your comments and after you i would like to request mr abdul kareem also to add on so we will have a combination of answer from uh, from both of you for the audience to understand how uh compliance um uh, and business could uh, lead together uh, for the growth of remittances okay thank you sir fraud i was just wondering that uh, chief compliance officer being a moderator how good compliance has not come into picture so far uh, anyways thank you very much uh, you see uh, again uh, the opportunity it's an opportunity basically what is the key role of compliance though as imad was saying that now uh, compliance controls business somewhat correct but uh, you see uh, at what cost i think uh, what our colleagues in compliance tell us to do is at the end of the day it's for the benefit of the business itself right so we have to be very clear and we have to realize that fact so one single transaction which is not compliant it can you know what it can <laughs> it can do actually so uh, however the biggest uh, uh, concern that i see when it comes to compliance is the fact that there is no standardization uh, specifically within the home remittance channels that we use uh, for transferring the information uh, the transactional information i mean uh, there is no standardization to the level which should have been there 
uh, every geography uh, operates as per their regulatory uh, norms and requirements. So uh, we may have very different set of requirements for when we, when it, we receive a transaction here in UAE, but uh, the send side country, uh, if it's uh, somewhere in US or uh, uh, Europe, uh, they may have uh, their own data privacy laws, which does not allow them to share the kind of information that we require over here to process a transaction. And that is where it creates uh, a problem for, uh, for, for the consumer itself, the, for the customer at the end of the day, because their transactions gets delayed, they are the ones who suffer. So this is something which regulators and companies and uh, MTOs like us, they need to sit together and evolve a process and procedure where there has some level of standardization to be adopted, which actually will facilitate the entire value chain of this uh, transaction. So I think that is uh, something very important to, uh, to achieve from a regulatory perspective. Mr. Abdul Kareem. Well, uh, as you rightly said, it's, it is a challenge actually. And uh, as you rightly said, Yanni, when you look at it, the regulators from different countries work in different methods. Now, of course, there are certain standards that are general all over, but yes, there is differences from country to country, from region to region. Uh, and even for, Yanni, when you look at it, even for same customers who are sending to different regions, you'll find different uh, aspects to it. But I think uh, here uh, the main thing is uh, that uh, adoption of technology which helps also the compliance where we have compli uh, very good compliance systems that are uh, in, in, let's say, inher inherited with what the actual regulations are. Because you have changing regulations that keep on uh, happening where uh, you need to have systems that are flexible, that are adaptable, where uh, whenever any change you need to do, you have to do it immediately. Because this is very important. So finding the right, uh, net, let's say, uh, technology that you can use, which is flexible, which is adaptable, because uh, there are a lot of uh, regulations that keep on coming. There are a lot of updates that keep on coming. And uh, your business does not stop. Your business is continuously happening on a daily basis. So it's very important uh, that you take this into consideration because at the end of the day, uh, the compliance is important for the country. It's important uh, for the company itself. And it's even important for people who are working using these uh, systems. So, so Yanni, at the end of the day, it, it's very important. But the person who really actually is affected is the customer. Going back to the customer once and twice for documentation, uh, for uh, registration, stuff like this, th this is an, uh, actually, it, it's not helping out giving the customer experience uh, a very easy, smooth experience. When I look at fintechs, their onboarding procedures, EKYC that they're using, it's very simple, it's, it's, it, there's no hassle-free. But when you come to the brick and mortar part, here you find there's a difference actually. So I think uh, uh, I mean, standardizing these is very important for the future in order to have a chance to, like let's say, for the brick and mortar of course, to come into context with the fintechs. So this is a very important thing I and mean, a lot of customers complain about that. Actually, I would like to add to that, really. I mean, we're talking about what strategies the brick and mortar banks can implement to actually be able to compete more effectively with fintech. <clears throat> and this is one of the biggest things, right? Brick and mortar have their costs when it comes to, you know, excessive regulation at times, and the cost of regulation is passed on to the customer. And that's the difference that fintech has brought in is by, by basically making it a more streamlined and efficient process they are reducing the overall cost, customer cost at the baseline and also by just creating that competitive environment. But as um, Abdul Karim was saying, we, um, we need to find a better way to streamline the regulatory and KYC AML processes. And really, what better way to do that than to then use the technology whereby you're using AI, for example, to make sure that you know, there's an integrated system that is consistently updating the latest regulatory requirements into your systems. You are using a reg tech. They call it reg tech now, right? You must know about this. So regulatory technology that's keeping things streamlined. So this is an essential part of ensuring that you know, 
you can't get away from compliance. There's no two ways about that. Compliance is here to stay. Compliance is here, as, as was just said, for the benefit of everybody, essentially, and most of all, even the customer. But it does cause hassles for the customer as well. And so what we need to learn as uh, you know, traditional institutions is that we need to adopt uh, some of these values from fintechs and figure out a way where we can maintain all the regulatory uh, requirements, but in a more streamlined manner that is much more cost efficient and time efficient. Thank you all. Um, being as a compliance officer of a financial institution, if I um, summarize to, to the uh, discussion what you have made on this particular point, what I have learned being as a compliance professional, that there is no finish line in compliance. And the compliance is a process of continuation. At the same time, compliance is always there to assist and to guide the business. Because what I learned on, the, on, the, um, on a very lighter note, that the compliance department is not the revenue generated department. Compliance is the department which always protects the revenue. And um, you know, the more remittances will take place, the more revenue will come and the more responsibility lies on compliance. Second, what I have uh, understood from the conversation that compliance, um, an effective compliance program um, based on the, uh, primarily the data, on the, on the client, client data and the technology. Because nowadays without technology, you can't meet the regulatory expectations. And this is what we have learned um, across the years uh, our regulator here in the UAE uh, uh, is leading the, the country, um, you know, in terms of the effective compliance program. So this is where we all, the business and compliance are participating to meet the, the country vision and the regulatory expectations. So thank you to all of you. I would like to ask Mr. Umar Farooq, since we are speaking a lot about the opportunities, challenges. This is our topic actually today when we are speaking about uh, a cross-border remittances. So what do you f uh, think, what are the challenges being posed to the remittances landscape by active participation of informal channels in cross-border payments? We heard in the previous se session also about Hawala, Hundi, and when we particularly, uh, our focus is to, uh, today uh, is the uh, the remittances opportunities for uh, for Pakistan corridor, and uh, we we all are aware that um, informal uh, remittances channels, Hawala and Hundi, they this is an ongoing uh, challenge for the for the for the economy of Pakistan. So, what do you uh, um, have your thoughts about uh, this, Mr. Omar Farooq? I just want to say before you start, the poor Hawala and Hundi guys, their ears will be burning today because we've really like. <laughs> Laid into them all morning so far. Okay, uh, so uh, you see, there has to be a multi-pronged strategy. Now, I'm uh, since uh, uh, this is specific to, uh, I'll keep spe uh, myself specific to Pakistan in this uh, response to this question. So there has to be a multi-pronged strategy uh, on one side where we develop systems to uh, promote workers' remittances through legal channels. There has to be um, a simultaneously a constant of, uh, effort to control or curtail down the uh, Hawala Hundi uh, operations. So, uh, Hawala Hundi operations has become very, very like, uh, though it's uh, informal, but it's very, very formal, let me tell you. They, they have a very proper uh, structures and systems in place. Uh, and uh, I mean, um, to the surprise of uh, my surprise and probably to few of others, uh, they even have product development uh, within their uh, network and structure. So they, they also run uh, an insurance, informal insurance uh, policy for their uh, customers as well. So, uh, for instance, uh, um, all their customers who are like uh, a pool of taxi drivers, they give uh, 50 dirhams to the Hawala Hundi operator every month and that acts as, a, as an insurance policy. So, if any of the uh, colleague taxi driver uh, uh, met an accident and suffers some injury or death, so that uh, money is paid to the to the family of that uh, individual. So uh, it's not just limited to the transfer of money, but to other uh, informal or illegal products uh, offering as well. 
So definitely, uh, there has to be a control on that. Uh, it could be through uh, diplomatic channels, through um, legislation, through uh, better administrative means, through better implementation of law and order. So, that, and because that's the only thing we, uh, way we can control that. At the same time, uh, efforts from the regulator, as we've been discussing, that rebate is increased. So, similar efforts we've been discussing at Stretch, uh, uh, Sony Dharti Remittance Program in Pakistan, SDRP. So, uh, I would like to thank One Link for developing that because I was uh, very, uh, I mean, part of that when it was being developed. So, uh, they have done a wonderful job. And uh, as uh, we were informed that more products are being offered through SDRP, like uh, 2,400 billers would also be added through SDRP. So, definitely that would add another incentive to the remitters to opt for legal channel and uh, gain points on SDRP and, uh, and pay uh, to, to those billers. And those billers include hospitals, schools, they can pay the... Uh, school fees for their kids, and there's a host of other uh, companies which are uh, um, on the billing list of one link. So similarly, uh, the State Bank of Pakistan has further um, um, uh, enhanced the marketing spend incentive that they've been giving for the last few years. So uh, that is another one uh, way to incentivize that. Uh, another uh, area that I would like to touch uh, uh, upon is basically uh, the B2B and C2B and B2C transactions. So one gentleman here was asking about a gig economy and, uh, and the funds getting delayed in that. So uh, that is one area where Pakistan um, is, can get a lot of uh, remittances back home because Pakistan is the fourth largest uh, freelancing uh, um, uh, market in the world. And a uh, few of the financial institutions, uh, Jazz is there, Faisal Bank and uh, HBL, they've already taken very serious steps to facilitate that. And uh, uh, many of the freelancers can now get m their funds from cross-border within, within a like within, uh, with few clicks because they usually maintain uh, their wallet accounts with uh, Payoneer and they can transfer back money uh, within seconds. So uh, we, uh, on the workers remittance or home remittance side, such uh, initiative needs to be taken and further product development needs to come into play which will uh, eventually help in curtailing down the Hawala Hundi uh, operations and further progression would be towards the legal channel. Thank you. If I can add to that also, Yanni, from the challenges actually, Yanni, when you look at it from this side, the sender side, you have a regulatory compliance issue also because these transactions are happening in an informal manner. So they're happening outside the regulatory framework. So when they're happening outside the regulatory framework, the regulator does not have eyes on what is actually happening. So this can actually uh, Yanni, have an effect also where we do know they have lack of knowledge of where the transactions are going so they can be used for illegal purposes. At the same time, you have challenges of the businesses who are also helping these uh, Hawala providers. You have a lot of companies that are working on that, and this is illegal. And this also affects also these people because actions will be can be taken against them from an illegal perspective also. And at the same time, the most, uh, let's say, uh, uh, businesses that are being affected by this are the exchange house businesses, actually. Because at the end of the day, they are legalized. They need to do according uh, to the, what is required for them. But at the same time, you have illegal channels that are making use of that and they are competing with them on that. And they are sending money through uh, illegal channels. So that's affecting also the competition between illegal channels and between legalized exchange houses who are doing business, actually. Just another thing on this is simply the fact that of course, going through these unofficial channels means that we're not recording the, the transactions. And as someone mentioned earlier, data is key. And we are unable to then see the impact, the socioeconomic impact of those transfers that are made through the informal channels, which then are not part of the general uh, official statistics. And it's, it makes it very difficult to track the progress of uh, any one country uh, via those channels. But I think that's we should give the Hundi and Hawala guys a rest now. So if I rightly understood that, uh, starting from Ms. Rumor till Ms. Shabnam, um, 
three of you have spoken about the informal um, channels who are actively participating in different norms in, in shape of insurance provider, uh, which is, you know, collecting money, supporting at the difficult time to the, uh, to the remitter. At the same time, uh, you have touched based on, uh, on the collaboration of the, the government. And today we have a representation from government, we have representation from banks, we have participation from the financial institutions. I would like to ask you, how can governments and international organizations support the remittances ecosystem to maximize benefits which minimize risk? Add to this, can you please share some examples of successful partnership between financial institutions and remittance service providers that have enhanced the cross-border remittance process? Uh, I think uh, the first part is somewhat a replication of what we've been discussing or what we've uh, responded in our um, answers. Um, all these efforts that we discuss about uh, initiatives of the State Bank of Pakistan and uh, the government and the currently, um, as we are all aware, there's some uh, serious action being taken against the Hawala Hundi operations. So these are all the... Um, uh, actions which definitely would facilitate um, home remittances through legal channels. At the same time, the incentives are going to play even further role. Uh, and uh, I mean, products like uh, uh, I mean, insurance and others, they can also facilitate. Another major is step taken by, um, by the Pakistan government a couple of years back was the launch of Russian digital account. Uh, so, and that was a, an end-to-end -end, uh, digital proposition that, uh, uh, that was uh, launched and, that, uh, and the results were in front of all of us. That was a huge success. Um, the, uh, within the first year of its launch, uh, the government was managed to get an incremental about $3 billion uh, through the through Russian digital account. And this was, uh, I mean, uh, separate to the, uh, to the routine workers' remittance that uh, Pakistan received. So, the product development, launching uh, new products, giving investment opportunities to the, to the diaspora, definitely these uh, efforts would actually help in improving the, uh, the, the overall landscape of remittances in the country. Also, if I can add, also from a compliance perspective, it's very important that uh, we, any, uh, the regulators develop a favorable regulation because here you're talking to different sectors of the society. So there should be a favorable uh, regulation that uh, attracts the customers, attracts the cu also the service providers in order to do business yani, in a legal way. And this is very important. Yani. And even for uh, the people, customers who are using uh, in uh, informal channels, it's very important to uh, invest in financial literacy programs, and it's very important also to inform them of lack of doing formal uh, remittances and lack of using financial services, what they are losing also, because actually they're not opening savings accounts, they're not using credit cards, there are a lot of th other things that they can benefit from uh, using fi uh, financial services, official financial services. So if, uh, if we go through and we do a lot of uh, campaigns, awarenesses in the camp areas here, I recall uh, seven years back, I think, uh, for Bangladesh, I remember the same thing happened seven years back, and I remember you know, one of the companies took over all that uh, progress at that time, and they went to the camps and they did a lot of uh, campaigning with the Bangladesh embassy at the time. So things like this can help a lot in giving education to people of the benefits of using actually formal financial services. Your final take. I will just add on it the fact that the State Bank of Pakistan uh, combined with the, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of uh, the Overseas Pakistanis obviously launched the, the, the remittance initiative that we know about. And within that remittance initiative, a lot has happened in terms of policy related matters, the fact that they're trying to increase accessibility by, uh, by engaging post offices and microfinance institutions in Pakistan as well. Um, they are looking at, you know, more, as, as uh, was mentioned by Umar, the RDA, which is, you know, a, a different type of product for, to encourage remittances into the country. 
Uh, we obviously have the loyalty program with the Sony Dirty Loyalty Program, which is, again, another initiative where they're trying to attract people. Uh, education is absolutely necessary on all fronts, whether it's uh, on the sending side or the receiving side in terms of people understanding. But by increasing the accessibility, whether it's going through your you know, mobile operators or post offices or other institutions, you're basically capturing your underbanked or unbanked and underserved population when it comes to uh, remittances, which is the majority of the population in, in Pakistan, as we mentioned, like we're only, we're only banking around 20% of the population is banked and the rest is not. So they all also need access and it's basically growing the financial inclusion of the community at large and bringing them into that mix so that they can actually benefit from being a part of the system as well. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm done with my questions with my panel.